So I guess to start things off, Tav, where did um, the idea to take someone from America and transport them to Vienna come from? Where did this all spark from? Well, it's a product of my tenure in Vienna mm -hmm. and my exposure to uh, vintage and classic film at the um, Albertina Film Museum mm -hmm. in Vienna. Prior to that, uh, my four years in Paris at the uh, attending the um, Cinematheque Francaise programs and uh, I've made a number of short films collected by the Cinematheque Francaise actually so I had um, <coughs> a carte blanche at the cinema there and when I got to Vienna uh, made a transition to Vienna I became immersed in the um, Viennale and the classic film presentations at the Albertina Film Museum and I I began to think about silent film, black and white film and narrative and this notion came to me about a screenplay for uh, an American girl a disaffected, alienated American girl in the part of Arkansas in which I grew up in America mm -hmm. because I in Europe I'll always be an American in Europe I'm not trying to be anything other than what I am so I had the idea of this cross-cultural uh, layering between the American South and the deep elaborated Viennese culture and also Austrian culture because the movie goes from the banks of the Arkansas River in that area in uh, North Little Rock directly to Vienna and then a transition to the Atase mm -hmm. in the Lake District of Austria at the Klimt Villa, the Gustav Klimt Villa yeah. where, the, where the part one of the Urania trilogy uh, concludes in a very tenuous way <laughs> because we're left at the end of part one with a big question mark on the screen which leaves the door open <laughs> to the sequel and uh, and hopefully to part three so I've got to ask when her journey takes us across overseas when did you realize that her figuring out about the the Nazi plunder when did this all come about when did her journey over there begin in your mind in the structure of the story well I was exposed in Vienna to um, stories and to realities of buried Nazi plunder in Lake Atase, also in a more remote lake, the Alze. This is true. There's uh, many divers have lost their lives going down to the bottom of these deep lakes trying to uh, ferret out this uh, treasure, which is lays beneath um, deceptively clear waters but at the bottom of these lakes are timbers and trees that have fallen into the lake over the centuries. Mm -hmm. And this, this treasure is underneath all of this debris at the bottom of the lake. So I'd heard stories about it in Vienna. And then I began to do research and I found out that it's, uh, it's all true. Stuff's down there. Not only did the Nazis uh, dump counterfeit American currency that they were manufacturing. They dumped the printing presses, the whole business, into those lakes. Also treasures they didn't want the Allies to get hold of. Um, but my story deals with a particular incident of Hitler's last mail run from Berlin to Munich. And there was a Junker 88 carrying gold and platinum ingots and a cargo of worthless mail. Hmm. Well, American forces shot that plane down in 1944 over the Atase, and down it went into the lake. Hmm. And I met in Vienna Graf Karl Heinz von Riegel, 
the great grandson of the SS officer in charge of these flights and he has a map that was bequeathed to him by his ancestors of the exact coordinates where that plane went down into the Atase, into Lake Atar. So I took this idea and I had been invited to Atase to the Klimt Villa where Von Riegel has a boathouse where he keeps his keep the boats of the Clinton Villa are kept and he summers there so I was invited over there to the boat I was invited to the Clint Villa I looked around I poked around I did a began to take a lot of photographs around there Gustav Mahler also used the Clint Villa as a uh, um, a, refu a, a retreat where he did some compositions and of course uh, Gustav Klimt and Emily Flüge, uh, one of his friends uh, and lovers, um, spent their summers at, at the Villa Palak, actually, colloquially called the Klimt Villa. Uh, Palak was a court tishla. Mm. He was a carpenter to the court, and he built this villa in 1874 in the style of lake architecture, all wood, mm. and many carvings there, um, and beautiful, beautiful, um, uh, wooden lake villa on the clear waters of the Atase. So I began to get these ideas to answer your question, Gaudi, uh, Gaudi uh, about a story, about a narrative, mm -hmm. and about someone from an entirely different culture coming into this uh, in a sort of a, a shocking way, kind of culture shock. Because in international cities like Paris, like Vienna, like New York, um, what makes it exciting and what makes the American experience exciting is the cross-cultural gradients. Cultures laid upon other cultures and interacting, and this is what I wanted to bring out, too, in my movie. And I also wanted to bring out poetic gradients. Urania, Urania descending. Mm -hmm. Urania, the muse of the heavens. A universal myth. And myth is important in our lives. It survives. It survives until today. And why? Because there are archetypes within the, our, our consciousness that are still fully constellated. And they carry powerful, emotional, intellectual and cultural uh, import within our lives. So I thought of the muse Aranya, the muse of the heavens, and I thought of her avatar coming to earth in the most unlikely form, that of an American girl. <laughs> In the American South, fed up with the strip malls, fed up with driving her BMW by the riverside, fed up with being accosted by over-testosterone males. Um, she one day was walking in a shopping center. She saw a travel poster for Vienna, a picture of a Fiacre carriage and the Stephens Dome Cathedral in the background, the Gothic Cathedral, and she thought, I'm going to go there. She impulsively went into the travel agency and she bought a one-way ticket to Vienna. And she went. She flew there alone. She got off the plane. She walked around the city with her little rollerboard behind her. And she ended up checking in Hotel Orient. This was a notorious Bordello hotel in Vienna, in the first district. This is where Orson Welles and Joseph Cotton stayed when they were filming The Third Man. Mm. This is where I met Kenneth Anger at a retrospective. He was staying in Hotel Orient. And uh, actually, I, I was making a short film at the time in Vienna. And we were filming at Hotel Orient on the Saturday following the day I met Kenneth Anger in an exhibition of his photographs from his movies in Vienna. So I convinced Kenneth to be in our movie portraying himself. This is the only movie Kenneth Anger has ever been in other than his own. Wow. And he plays the tarot cards in the lobby of Hotel Orient and wow. is conjuring up the character of Phantomas in which he transforms me 
uh, from Tap Falco into Fantomas in the top hat and the evening clothes and the, the dagger up the sleeve. And so um, I had an acquaintance then with Hotel Orient. This had to figure in my movie and uh, this property and all that it represents in Vienna. And then in Cafe Central, where the character of Gina Lee, the American girl, goes after she checks in the hotel. She goes for a light supper, walks over to Cafe Central in the first district. This is the, this is the Italianate um, in the Palais Freyung, Palais Ferstel, excuse me. Cafe Central, the famous Central where uh, Sigmund Freud had his, Sigmund, Sigmund Freud, Dr. Freud had his Wednesday night meetings of his circle of psychiatrists where Leon Trotsky was plotting revolution at the chess boards no. um, in Cafe Central. So there Gina Lee meets Diego Moritz. He represents a Swiss cartel of investors interested in uncovering that Nazi plunder of gold and platinum and getting that map from Von Riegel. Mm. Karl Heinz Von Riegel now a playboy in Vienna, known in the Vienna's Bermuda Triangle in the First District, and known in the Tango Demimonde de Vienna, and also known once he gets a few drinks too many in the presence <laughs> of beautiful women, he starts talking about his obsession, his compulsion to uncover that treasure at the bottom of the Atuze. So Diego Moritz pitches to Gina Lee. They're looking for a young woman to to meet Von Riegel and to fleece that map off of him and to fleece it off of him like a Harvard graduate. <laughs> and she takes she takes on the mission for a price. And um, she meets Von Riegel at Tango Bar late at night. She and Diego Moritz go to Tango Bar. And before that, he has taken her for private tango lessons so she can dance with, with Von Riegel. <laughs> so he takes her to Tango Bar, and he knows Von Riegel a little bit, <clears throat> has met him before. So he introduces Gina Lee to Karl Heinz Von Riegel, and the story takes off from there. The intrigue begins to solidify and begins to expand and elaborate and suspense and a concentration though begins to shoot off 90 miles in all directions but a concentration of a fate the reaching arm hand of fate has touched these two people and it follows them from Vienna from Hotel Orient Cafe Central from Tango Bar all the way to the Atuze and from there, we have the denouement of part one. Wow, I think you've sold it so well. <laughs> well, Tav, thank you so much for the time. I hope people check this out. I can't wait to see the remainder of the trilogy. And thank you so much for, for telling us this. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Pleasure, Gotti.